So I was, we have to switch now to a different topic and uh, sort of have, I have been asked to talk about influenza viruses. And obviously uh, we are all worried about COVID-19. And the question is, can we learn something from the influenza virus story? And what is it we can learn uh, from it? So uh, the title is, why do we vaccinate against influenza? again and again. So we all are aware of the 1918 uh, pandemic caused by influenza viruses, and that's really uh, what uh, is in the back of our minds of many of us. And uh, we really would like to understand what this could mean in terms of COVID-19. And the next slide shows us we have, uh, it's a famous uh, 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 photograph from uh, Cam Funston uh, where uh, one sees many, many people uh, during the 1918 pandemic uh, who were lying in a big, big uh, hole. And you can imagine, uh, we all know that flu is transmitted uh, via, uh, via an aerosol, but this did not really help in terms of uh, uh, isolating people. And uh, as we all uh, have heard, uh, there is a very dramatic reduction in life expectancy in the United States. Uh, over the last 100 years, uh, uh, predominantly because of the 1918 pandemic, uh, where, we had, where we see an 11 a year drop. So this is something really dramatic. And if we look at the number of total uh, deaths worldwide, succumbed to an in the pandemic influenza, the estimates are between 50 and 100 million. Now, this is in light of the population, which was a, approximately a quarter of what we have today, 2 billion versus 8 billion today. So that these 50 to 100 million is a large number of deaths. So I'm not belittling COVID-19. We're all scared to death about it. But uh, in terms of influenza, it was actually over a very brief period of time two to three months, uh, end of 1918, beginning of 1919, uh, where the estimates are extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily high. I just have two slides showing that even then, uh, vaccines uh, were thought to be effective. And uh, what was sold by the Wellcome company and the uh, proud successes of Wellcome from that company is GSK. And they were happy to actually sell uh, a bacterial vaccine <laughs> of, uh, at the time it was uh, uh, just uh, several years that Bacillus influenza was discovered by Pfeiffer, but uh, this was not the agent which really caused it. So this really just shows you, uh, we have a long history of vaccines. In the 1918 situation, it actually was not uh, the right one. I also want to mention that we actually know quite a lot about the 1918 uh, virus. And I just want to show one slide here. Uh, this is from a, um, a science paper. It's now almost uh, it's 15, 17 years back. And we were able together uh, with Terry Tompe from, uh, the, from the CDC re reconstruct the entire 1918 uh, virus uh, in the laboratory based on the sequence which was obtained by Jeffrey Taubenberger from material uh, of soldiers and also uh, people who were um, who died in, in um, Alaska. So uh, we have really studied this virus very, very carefully, trying to find out uh, what was so uh, unique about this virus. And uh, we really know uh, quite fortunately quite, quite a lot about it. And let me just sort of um, suggest that we have a virus here which looks somewhat similar to COVID-19. It's also an RNA virus. It has spikes on the outside, and these spikes are the hemagglutinin, which is the most important one, but also uh, the new immunities. And inside, we have these uh, eight RNA molecules, which represent the genome of the virus. Now, uh, the important thing in terms of uh, the uh, vaccines and what we can do about viruses is that uh, they are unfortunately 
many different um, influenza virus hemagglutinins. And um, these are different, there are different subtypes. Uh, we have uh, 18 different influenza virus hemagglutinin, and uh, this is uh, quite uh, impressive. Uh, in terms of humans, we only have three. Uh, we have only H1, H2, and H3 uh, over the last 100 years. But uh, these other 18 different hemagglutinin subtypes uh, are found in viruses from a variety of animals, be it uh, birds, reindeer, whales. So it's a wide variety of uh, different influenza viruses. And we have to be afraid that uh, an H14 and H7 actually uh, could jump from an animal into humans. And we all know the H5, uh, the bird, bird flu and the H7 uh, have uh, kept us on our toes because uh, many uh, birds, turkey farms, etc., had to cull uh, their, uh, their animals because of the uh, emergence of these other than H1, H2, H3 viruses. And uh, that is important uh, in terms of the possibility that a new pandemic uh, does occur. And no one really knows uh, what uh, might happen in the future, but uh, it is really a situation which is um, uh, difficult to um, um, predict in a way. You know? And uh, it, one can only say, yes, it might happen, but uh, there's this old saying, it's always difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. So I really want to be very careful uh, in terms of what these other viruses uh, with different hemagglutinin subtypes might bring. Uh, this is just to uh, tell us exactly what we have uh, in the last 100 years in terms of human influenza viruses. And if we start from the bottom, uh, we can see here that uh, we had the H1N1 from the 1918. And I uh, mentioned before that we know really quite a lot about this virus. And uh, we had H1N1 viruses until really 1957, when a different subtype H2N2 emerged. Uh, there is no real reason that this H2N2 was only there for 11 years. Uh, in 68, we suddenly had H3N2 viruses popping up, and uh, we are still in 2022 have these H3N2 viruses. Uh, then in 1977, H1 uh, appeared, and uh, then in 2009, uh, another H1N1 appeared, so the, uh, the pandemic H1, so that we have right now uh, an H3 virus and H1 virus, and then we have the influenza B viruses, which are a completely different type, and uh, that uh, these viruses are co-circulating with the influenza A viruses, and we have had uh, two lineages, the Victoria and uh, the Yamagata lineage, and I will say something about this extraordinary, uh, let me just say the B Yamagata has died out, and we have no idea why we have not seen these viruses for two years. So there's another uh, new uh, twist in uh, the saga of what influenza viruses are doing. But so far, uh, let me just uh, say that we have these pandemic strains in 1918, in 57, 68, and also in 2009. Uh, then there's popping up of another H1 virus. And then we can see the color changes indicate that we get variants. And in general, if I get infected today, 2022, or let's make it in, in 2000, if one was infected uh, in 2000, then uh, one was protected uh, for about two or three years against a new infection. But because the virus changes, uh, one could get reinfected and also get the disease. So in other words, infection protection by infection and protection by vaccination, what is always on the two or three years from uh, when the vaccine is given or when the uh, disease has occurred. So this is something very, very un uh, unique and uh, is really uh, something uh, other vaccines uh, do not uh, experience. 
uh, it is really uh, unique that this influenza virus vaccine has to be given every every year. And because of this new uh, vaccine formulation, uh, we have uh, a real problem in terms of one getting rid of the virus, but also uh, having effective uh, effective vaccines. So this is something we really uh, have to realize that influenza is different from measles, different from mumps, different from rubella, different from smallpox. These viruses don't appear to change. Uh, influenza does, and we we understand why this is, but. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, it's uh, unique. And the question is, therefore, how is COVID-19, uh, sars cov two behaving? And uh, uh, that's sort of always uh, we have to um, think uh, about and uh, protect ourselves. Now, what kind of vaccines do we have in terms of influenza virus uh, vaccines? We have inactivated ones, is not inactive. Uh, these are viruses. Or vaccines which are made by growing the virus in tissue culture and embryonic traits, and then uh, treating them with formaldehyde or beta propylactone uh, to make them uh, non um, infectious anymore. And what is being given is the protein against which we make uh, an immune response. Uh, there is not only most of the influenza virus vaccines are in a, of the in a, with the inactivated platform. However, there is also a live attenuated one, which is a cold adapted virus, and that is particularly good for children and uh, can protect uh, against uh, the disease. And then uh, most recently, we also have a purely recombinant uh, influenza virus vaccine where the hemagglutinin is basically made in tissue culture, and then uh, the hemagglutinin is given as a Vaccine. So these three platforms exist, and um, they are all three are being used. And uh, the composition of the 2021 to 2022, so that this, this season, we have four different um, strains, uh, which makes the vaccine mixture. So we have two. Uh, influenza A viruses and the number and the uh, names are also always where the virus was isolated and the isolated number and the year. And so we have an H1 component and H3 component. And then we have a two influenza B virus component uh, from the Yamagata and from uh, the Victoria line. So these four are they, when we buy a vaccine right now, or at December last year then uh, all of these vaccines, whether they were uh, a, in, of the inactivated form of the life attenuated form or of the recombinant uh, form, they were always containing those four uh, components, two influenza A viruses, two influenza B viruses. Now, um, as these changes occur constantly, uh, it is difficult really to, um, be always on time and uh, in terms of and predict actually what kind of variant will be uh, prevalent. And uh, in February, usually uh, we, decide, we decide, uh, and we means the FDA and the CDC, uh, looks at the data of what has been circulating uh, in the winter or even in the summertime in the Southern hemisphere and then makes a decision what kind of um, variants are being included. Now, if a new uh, pandemic strain comes, uh, this can be very, very difficult. And uh, this is the famous slide from 2009, where the uh, blue curve shows when, and these are data from the United States, the blue line shows when the vaccine was shipped out, but the influenza uh, was, influenza, influenza-like illness uh, that was measured uh, was actually way before that because shipping the vaccine doesn't mean that people have it. Uh, it then takes uh, probably two or three uh, weeks to distribute it uh, to different uh, pharmacies and, and, and physicians. But, uh, and then it takes another two weeks until the vaccine really works. So the blue curve was really, we should have uh, the blue curve, yeah, the red one was, and 
and not uh, the other way around. And this, uh, fortunately, this 2009 pandemic strain was a very mild one, but uh, we certainly were not prepared. In, or we certainly didn't have anything substantial to bring against uh, this pandemic strain in terms of vaccines. No. Uh, we can then uh, sort of look at the data again from the US. We have uh, the burden of the influenza is uh, quite dramatic. Uh, we have, uh, depending what year it is, or, I don't want to say good year or bad year, but in terms of the number of deaths in the US, this can be from 10,000. Uh, uh, in this in one or two years, actually, we, we had uh, about 80,000. Uh, these data are between uh, 2015 and 2020. Uh, hospitalizations, quite large numbers, and the number of cases again. So this is really what we have to deal with uh, in terms of influenza. And uh, unfortunately, despite having good antivirals, which we are not talking about here, but uh, and I think good vaccines uh, in terms of influenza vaccines, better than their reputation, still we have a big uh, problem in terms of influenza. And then I just want to mention briefly uh, that uh, we uh, are developing, like many other different groups, on a universal influenza virus vaccine, a vaccine which is actually um, should protect against all variants against, and all subtypes. Uh, so in other words, uh, how can we uh, do better? And uh, we have, uh, we uh, means uh, Florian Kramer, Adolfo Garcia Sosto and myself, we are three independent groups at Mount Sinai, and we have uh, have put our forces together to develop a universal influenza virus vaccine, which we think should protect against all uh, variants as well as all uh, the subtypes. And then, in, in essence, what we are doing is we are trying to induce an immune response against the green portion of the hemagglutinin. So we have here uh, the, just the monomer of a hemagglutinin spike. We have about a uh, thousand of these spikes per virus particle, and there is a head which is uh, uh, blue in this case and uh, brown in the H5. And we are making chimeric structures. We, uh, we humans have no experience with H8 and H5, but we all have seen H1. And by boosting with a CH1 construct, uh, our immune system doesn't really recognize H8. And then if we come with a second, uh, virus, uh, which has the same H1 as the first one, but a different H5, we have sort of, uh, we, we have eliminated the head really in terms of the immune uh, response. There's very little immune response against H5 and H8, but uh, it's fortunately, uh, we get an increase uh, against the uh, H1 uh, uh, portion of the semiglutinin. So this is our approach for a human uh, un uh, universal influenza virus vaccine. And uh, we would need two components. There are two groups of the hemagglutinins, as I mentioned before, uh, and uh, there's also an influenza B virus. So this universal flu uh, vaccine would consist of three different um, preparations we, uh, in which we uh, uh, attempt to make an immune response against the conserved uh, stalk as compared to the uh, head, which is varying and defines most of the uh, subtypes. So this is really what we are trying to do. And we are in phase two trials and hope that, uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't want to say unfortunately, because uh, uh, we, are, we, we are also working on COVID-19 and this is really a big, big problem, but uh, the interest and the support has been somewhat delayed, obviously, because of COVID-19, but we hope that our universal influenza virus vaccine approach uh, will uh, move forward. Now, uh, let me end up with some uh, something which is very, very strange, and that is, and these are the data just from our Mount Sinai surveillance program, and we have the different seasons, 2016, 2017, 2018, and uh, as you all remember, in February of 2020, uh, we were suddenly hit with the COVID-19. 
and uh, the season was almost over of flu, and we have uh, the lower left uh, panel here where we have the red influenza A viruses and blue influenza B viruses, and by uh, January, February, uh, this influenza season was over, but it was a, a regular uh, season where we have 50-50 uh, influenza A and 50 influenza B. The next season, 2020, was completely abnormal. And uh, you can see uh, that there is a flat curve. There is no influenza A, you know, and basically no influenza B virus. The numbers are that we had 100 times fewer infections, 100 times fewer hospitalizations, and 100 time, times fewer deaths in the United States in the 2020 to 21 season are caused by influenza. And that is uh, difficult, and maybe in the discussion we can talk about it, it's difficult to understand. Now this season, the 2021-22 season, so what we just ended basically, uh, we have about a tenfold lower frequency. If you look at the y-axis uh, of the 2019 season versus the 21, uh, we have uh, 200 versus 20 uh, isolates. It's really about a tenfold lower than a regular year. And very, very interesting, uh, one influenza B virus lineage, the um, lineage which uh, is referred to as a Yamagata, uh, just disappeared. So we have since uh, 2020, uh, for two years now, we have no Yamagata influenza B virus. And no one understands this. And uh, we have the Victoria lineage that is very few cases, but we have no influenza B virus from the Yamagata lineage. So uh, go figure, as we say here, we have no explanation why this is. And uh, we are still uh, in a situation where we have much less uh, flu, at least 10 times less than we had pre-COVID-19. And uh, uh, it is very, very difficult to really make sense of this, that the virus completely disappeared uh, for one season. And now the B. Amagata uh, lineage, which was quite common, always 50-50 really, uh, over the last 20 years, uh, has uh, completely uh, has ceased to exist. So let me then summarize uh, that uh, we had uh, four influenza pandemics in the last 100 years. The first one was really uh, a, a very serious, and I'm not belittling COVID-19. I'm, I'm very uh, I'm scared to death of this virus, but uh, we had really in 1918, as I said, 50 to 100 million people died worldwide. And that was when we had a quarter of the population uh, as uh, today. Uh, we have seasonal strain changes, which determine annual vaccine changes. And today we have uh, four components. Uh, the third or the second flu B component was completely useless because we don't have that virus left. Uh, and uh, uh, we are not sure how, uh, we didn't have enough viruses last year uh, where we had 100 times fewer virus uh, incidents, et cetera. Uh, we don't know how good the prediction was, uh, but uh, at least for the last 20, 30 years, we have fairly good vaccines and uh, they are really better than their reputation because I think they also prevent a serious disease uh, in terms of an influenza virus infection. And uh, also, I think there is some uh, hope uh, at the end, that there's some light at the end of the tunnel. We are working on universal influenza virus vaccines. And I think uh, it should be possible uh, to do this. We know much more about influenza virus, the, the structure of the virus uh, than, we used, than we knew 20 years ago. So I'm pretty hopeful that uh, this will be a problem uh, which we can solve. And then also uh, good antivirals are available, which uh, makes it uh, something we can uh, use in should a new pandemic occur. And uh, I think this is sort of the situation with influenza right now. Uh, we have continuously new uh, surprises, but I think uh, there is with the vaccines, as we have heard, uh, 
from Dr. Sarin before, they are really good uh, in terms of COVID-19. And so I hope uh, with what we all know about viruses, I think uh, we are in a much better position than certainly 1918, but just a better off than we were 10 or 20 years ago. And let me stop with this. Thank you, Peter, for a very exciting talk, putting influenza in relation uh, to COVID-19. Uh, we have time for very few questions. Maybe I can start with one remark. So as, as far as I got at the universal influenza vaccine that you are uh, in the process of developing is kind of not aiming at neutralization, but of binding, optimization, aggreg uh, aggregation, and so on. Is that correct or is that? Yes, the antibodies against the stalk, uh, ADCC, uh, antibody, antibody yeah. dependent, cell cytotoxicity kind, and uh, there is some neutralization with some of them, but you are absolutely right. The mechanism uh, is one via ADCC rather than regular neutralization. Yeah, maybe that's a good, um, a good hint or argument also in the COVID-19 field, uh, in the process of what we are discussing here. Is there any other question? Can I, I don't yeah. see one in the chat. Yeah, Uga. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Peter. Thank you. This is this is this is really exciting. On one of your slides, uh, the, uh, there is this this remark uh, uh, guiding immune responses from immunodominant uh, to common yeah. regions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is something that 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 we that we start also to learn for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, what would you say from your experience? Yeah. Uh, in influenza, what is your prediction? Because we have now this discussion, should we mix uh, different variants or should we, <laughs> should we, should we focus the immune response to the common, common regions? What would be your advice? I think uh, uh, as you pointed out, I mean, one that really has to do, I think preclinical data are important uh, whether one should give it sequentially or at the same time. Uh, and uh, then I think, as you pointed out, I mean, the ultimate animal model is us, you know, and that will uh, sort of determine really what way we can go. Unfortunately, I have been a long time in this field, as you know, and I am every, every season we have a new surprise. And, uh, <laughs> but I think uh, it is uh, something to consider. Obviously, also the HIV people are really trying for, for not centuries, but for decades now to look for some common uh, epitope or common domain. And it ain't that easy. That's all I want to say. Thank Michael? you. Yeah, uh, Peter, thank you. Uh, do you expect when Corona would finally disappear, did you then expect that uh, there would be a very bad influenza season coming up? <laughs> your, your prediction is as good as mine, okay? okay. I, really, I, I, I have to be very humble. I really, it's, it's very, I think also if you ask different people in the field, I think you have the whole spectrum. You know, it is unfortunate. Yes. Maybe, maybe there's no, I hope there's no journalist here, but I think we <laughs> should recognize that we really don't know enough about it. Yeah. Christina? A little bit along the same line, and we heard from our Robert Koch Institute that it was in particularly hard to predict which H and N combination would be the next um, variant that would come up in our winter season. So how do you envision that and during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, you could probably have a better prediction system to choose the most probable fitting vaccine variant? It seems to be harder than before, but I don't know whether you would have the same kind of impression. I think, for example, the mRNA platform allows one to decide very fast what one wants to do. So one could wait longer in the year. So as I mentioned briefly, we are making the decision, we at FDA and I have served on all of, some of the, all of these committees, we make the decision in February, what will be given in November. If we wait until July, yeah, then we have the sort of knowledge what's happening in New Zealand and in Australia. So that would probably help if we could wait, wait until let's say even September. Yeah? 
and then decide what now we would only need three components you're not even four yeah so it's difficult to and that would make it much easier if we only need three rather than four so i think that is a way where we could um save some or have a better um understanding what what variant of concern we should use yeah 